a week after arriving at Epiphany in Coon Rapids, as, as my first assignment as a priest, I received a letter in the mail from the Archdiocese. I'll let you know every time that a priest receives a letter in the mail and says the Archdiocese, your, your heart kind of pounds a little bit, especially your first week as a priest, and you think, what did I do, right? And so it was a first experience for me of receiving a letter, and so I, I immediately opened it up and my, my jaw dropped. Because the letter said this, Dear Father Carlson, please find enclosed your funeral liturgy planning guide. We would like you to plan your funeral. I'm 26 years old. I never thought about my funeral at all. This is crazy, I think. And so sure enough, it literally is a form that every single priest gets in the archdiocese about a week after arriving to your assignment saying, what readings do you want? What songs do you want? Who do you want to to celebrate your funeral mass? Who do you want to preach it? Where do you want it located? This happens in other dioceses as well. And I've heard of a priest uh, in a different archdiocese who received this form and filled it out saying, well, I'd like to have my funeral at St. Peter's in Rome. And and I'd like to have the Pope available. If not, I guess I'll take the second in charge. Needless to say, he got a call from the archdiocese saying, that's not happening. But as I looked at that form, I I guess it it caused me to to pause and really question. What readings do I want? What songs do I want? Where do I want the funeral liturgy to be? And by the way, a little pastoral note here. It's not a bad thing for all of us to consider. Why? Because it can really help your children when it comes time for planning uh, that, that beautiful, amazing liturgy. And we have resources in the office to help with this. And as I started to reflect on this, by the way, even more, I I realized "Ah, I don't really care too much about the songs. It'll be the archbishop, whoever it is, hopefully can can do my funeral. The location, wherever, just make sure it's a church. But when it came to the readings, I, I paused. And I thought, what gospel would I want? And I brought it to prayer a little bit. And what came back, of course, was the gospel we heard today. John 6, 51 to 58. This beautiful passage on the Eucharist. And why this passage? Let's go right to John 6, 51. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. The bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. Jesus wanted to give himself completely to each and every one of us. Of course, as soon as the people heard this in the synagogue, they questioned Jesus. They said, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? And so they asked him this question. And how does Jesus respond? He doesn't answer the question. Because at that time, there is no way that they could comprehend what was going to happen. And so instead of answering the question here in the later part of the discourse, or in this discourse, by the way, Jesus is saying what? Whoever gnaws on my flesh, he said, in the past, God gave you food for the journey, essentially, something to eat. But he's saying, now the bread that I give, the flesh that I give, I want you to gnaw on. I want you to consume. I want it to be part of you. Well, how can this be possible? This is scandalous. But then we fast forward. And we see that Jesus does what? He offers himself up as the sacrificial lamb. The sacrificial offering. We fast forward to the Last Supper. His words, this is my body. This is my blood. will link this transformation to his death. For death is signified by body separating by blood. And he says what? Given for you. I am doing this sacrifice for you. Giving of myself completely in this sacrificial offering. Once again, when was the Last Supper happening? It was the Passover. It was the Passover. And he's saying, whoever eats of me now, it's not just the Passover from sin 
Well, from slavery into freedom, it's a Passover from this world to the next. This is what we call the Eucharist, the food for our journey. Him offering himself up. And when we eat of him, when he becomes part of us, we share in his sacrifice. If we step back and look at Jesus, by the way, it always seems uh, almost stupid that why would, he, why would he give himself up to death on a cross? He's God. But when we step back even farther, we see how beautiful it was. Because it bears witness that this sacrifice, even when it looks like complete failure, is actually, in a sense, an even more sense, it shows up that through the sacrificial offering that he gave himself on the cross, that we are able to trans- be able to be transformed and go from this world to the next. We hear that eating and drinking of the body and blood of Christ is the remedy of the foolishness which is rooted in each and every one of us. This foolishness we hear about in Proverbs in our first reading, in Ephesians as well, that he has this remedy for the foolishness of our life, for the sin of our life. And whoever eats of him will live forever. But it's not only that. It's not only that longing to be with him in heaven and this food for the journey. You and I know as well that every single time that we consume of the Eucharist, we are transformed. And we're receiving this complete gift of love. It's St. Alphonsus Liguori who's writing on the scripture passage, who states, Well, why should Jesus so ardently desire us to receive him? In the Eucharist. It is because love always sighs for us. And love always tends to want a union with the object of the beloved. We are God's beloved children. And he desires to give himself completely to us. St. Alphonsus continues. True friends wish to be united in such a manner to become only one. True friends wish to be united in a manner as to become only one. The love of God for us is being immense. He destined us to possess him not only in heaven, but also here below, by the most intimate union, under the appearance of bread and the Eucharist. And so every single time that we come, when we receive Jesus, we're receiving this most intimate bond of love. He's transforming us, and we're allowing ourselves to be transformed. Yes, to share in his sacrifice, but even more importantly, to share in his love and to be the beloved child that he desires us to be in him.